Hey everybody, so my son is sick today, so be good for whoever is there with you guys now. So today is our last lecture of the year. So take out your notebooks, get out your computers, let's do notes to kind of finish up um, the Vietnam War and to finish up lecture for the year. Yay! And then after that, with whatever time that's left, you guys can play Kahoot to review for the test or you can work on your review questions. Remember, last night you should have turned in your president notes, and you should have also turned in your participation self-assessment. If you haven't done that yet, make sure you turn your president notes. You only had to go to Nixon. You could have deleted all the presidents after that. And make sure you turn your participation self-assessment. I already graded some of them, uh, and I'll keep grading those today at home. I'll take my son probably, I assume, for a COVID test this morning. But then after that, I'll keep grading stuff. Okay, so I'll be here and you can send me emails if you've got questions. Due tonight by midnight are the 10 review questions. Do any 10 questions on the review sheet. Play the Kahoot with the review sheet, study, and then the test is already open. So you can take the last test whenever over the modern era, not during this class period. So when you get home by yourself, you can use your book notes, internet like always, 50 questions, multiple choice matching. Many of them you've seen before from the quiz over the Cold War era. Study for the test, try your best, and yeah, then we'll be pretty much done for the year. I was planning on taking textbooks today, but obviously I'm not there, so I'm hoping to be there Thursday, and if not, Thursday the sub will have to take your books, but um, Thursday I'll hopefully be there, and then I'll collect your textbooks, and remember each of you will present two slides, any two slides from your project, and I'll be finishing up grades this week as well. Make sure if you've got any last minute late work you want to turn in, you get that turned in to me as well. Or email me if you need any help or have any questions. All right, so let's get into this. So today we're going to finish up with the Vietnam War. And we're going to be talking about Chapter 19, Section 3. We kind of did that overview yesterday of Chapter 19, Section 2, and a little bit of stuff from Chapter 20. So if you think back to yesterday, what was a major criticism of the draft? So you guys remember? No tickets today, unfortunately, but we will pull tickets, you know, on Friday for one last time for this year. But remember, the problem with the draft was, in terms of exemptions, it was college kids. College kids could get a deferment, it's meaning that if you had money to go to school, if you were well-educated, you did not have to basically serve in this war. So unlike previous wars, um, you know, where it fell upon all social classes, people felt like the burden of fighting was placed on the lower middle class in the lower class, which was completely unfair. The other interesting thing, of course, about this picture was, remember, the military at this point is integrated. Um, so we see people who are all genders, or I shouldn't say all genders, all races, all ethnic groups fighting. But remember, it's not all genders yet. Women are still expected to only serve as nurses. We don't see them in combat. So at the very end of Johnson's last year in office, um, remember, what's going to happen is that the Viet Cong, okay, so our guerrilla fighters who are in South Vietnam, who are trying to kind of blow it up from the inside out, receiving supplies from Ho Chi Minh along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, who are trying to, you know, unite North and South Vietnam together and make it a communist countries, they launch a whole bunch of surprise attacks, um, basically on South Vietnam, specifically on the U.S. military bases, these are, you know, really kind of um, organized well, uh, led by, you know, Ho Chi Minh's uh, generals. And it is kind of a disaster in terms of the fact that they have huge amounts of casualties. I mean, so many people that are Viet Cong die. And so the American media tries to play this up as, um, oh, well, look how many of these people died in this attack. Clearly, you know, because remember they're reporting our death toll each day and how many Viet Cong have been killed. And as the Americans defend their bases, you know, many, many Viet Cong are wiped out. So we're like, see, we're winning, clearly. But in all reality, the part that the media really kind of focused on and what the American people tended to focus on was, wait a minute, you know, if President Johnson keeps claiming that we're winning this war and it's almost over, um, then how are they able to launch this major attack to begin with? Where are they getting all these guns and supplies? And they almost gained territory here. Uh, and they did kill some Americans. American casualty rates are still going up. You know, how is this even possible in this Tet Offensive? And the Tet is like the Vietnamese New Year. So it was kind of like with their New Year celebrations, and they decided to attack 
Um, no one really expected it at that time of year. You know, it'd be like if we were attacking on you know, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, no one would ever really expect, um, you know, a major attack or battle to be happening at that point. But how is that even possible that these people who are supposed to be so weak could launch this attack? So Americans really start to question um, LBJ more than ever. And LBJ at this point, um, you know, he was debating perhaps, you know, running for another term. He's decided at this point not to run for another term. The Tet Offensive, as well as all of these losses, was, you know, really part of that decision. You know, he said that he, you know, would not seek another term as president, and if he was nominated, he would not accept it. And now more so than ever, uh, people start to realize the Tet Offensive was the true turning point, you know, in Vietnam. And it's not a good turning point. It's not like the Americans are moving towards a victory. It's a turning point, but for, you know, the North Vietnamese and for the Viet Cong, they are closer than ever to winning this war. Their determination, their strength is resolved. You know, they see us as the invaders, the occupiers, no different than the Chinese, the Japanese, um, you know, and they, they want us out so they can choose whatever government they want. And our resolve, our reason to fight is really lacking. Many soldiers and many Americans at home who are protesting the war are really starting to wonder why we're there. Remember, most Americans do support the war in Vietnam. Um, they're anti-communism spreading, and they're still very fearful in terms of the domino theory that if Vietnam falls, I think all, everything will fall, but still, there's many who are still wondering. But overall, now there is still a credibility gap. So people are starting to wonder, you know, can you really trust President Johnson from what he's saying and what he's claiming? So as you guys are taking notes, I know I didn't highlight anything again today, but it didn't look good up against the screen background. Make sure that you write down that the Tet Offensive is basically like the turning point when North Vietnam attacked, you know, South Vietnam. And the credibility gap is people are starting to question whether they can believe Johnson. And so overall, people are starting to really question the government more so than ever before. And this is really kind of giving kind of more credit to the counterculture movement. And if you guys aren't ready to move on, and you still need time to write, then you can obviously just hit pause. The Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive was a shocking military campaign and the major turning point in the Vietnam War. On January 30, 1968, the North Vietnamese Army and Southern Communist rebels known as the Viet Cong launched massive surprise attacks in mountainous regions on the Laos-Cambodia border. 85,000 North Vietnamese troops attacked five major cities in South Vietnam and almost 100 additional towns, villages, and military installations. They also attacked the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, partially penetrating the walls. A departure from previous guerrilla tactics, North Vietnam intended to achieve a decisive victory that would end the conflict. But the fight was messy. The shocking strategic move marked a major turning point of the Vietnam War. After weeks of fighting, there was no clear victory on either side. The Viet Cong in North Vietnam suffered a great military loss. By the time the fighting ceased, they had lost an estimated 58,000 men. The Viet Cong also failed to take any South Vietnamese or American strongholds. The U.S. lost 4,000 troops, and more than 14,000 South Vietnamese men, women, and children had been killed. But despite a lower number of casualties, the United States did not emerge as winners either. For Americans, the offensive raised troubling questions. President Johnson and his advisors had promised for years that victory in Vietnam was just around the corner. Yet the television footage of U.S. Embassy personnel fighting with Viet Cong rebels showed otherwise. The Johnson administration had misled the American people about the realities of the Vietnam War. These realities included the brutalization of innocent civilians. In the heat of the U.S. campaign against the Tet Offensive on March 16, 1968, U.S. troops stormed the small South Vietnamese hamlet of My Lai, expecting Viet Cong guerrillas. Finding only women, children, and elderly, they raped and killed up to 500 villagers. The massacre became synonymous with American military power gone awry. Public opinion on the war shifted, and the national confidence in President Johnson's Vietnam strategy dropped to an all-time low. This led Johnson to halt escalation, pull down troop strengths, and limit bombing in North Vietnam. Though the war raged on for several more years, the Tet Offensive helped turn the tide of American public opinion against the war, 
paving the way for American withdrawal and the eventual defeat of South Vietnam. So we'll talk more about the My Lai Massacre here in just a minute, but you can really see that, you know, high casualty rates on both sides, but it's more so about even though the U.S. might have lower casualty rates, it's really about turning that tide of public opinion against the war. So on this slide, there's nothing you really need to kind of write down, but you can really just kind of see, you know, how um, depressed President Johnson is there. And as I said before, he says, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Um, this is in 1968, of course, which becomes one of the most violent years in American history. Uh, in 1968, Dr. King is assassinated. And remember, we talked about that, how it launches kind of all these riots throughout the country. Um, as people say, the civil rights movement could have gone so much further, but now it's lacking a leader. Also in 1968, um, Bobby Kennedy is assassinated, and he was kind of the front runner for the Democratic Party. Um, so in your notes, I guess if you wanted to put anything down, you could just say 1968 was a very violent year. Um, many people are murdered. There's all these rebellions and riots. Uh, you know, in terms of anti-war protests, civil rights movement protests, uh, protests over the Democratic Party candidate, and really just the future of America. And people are starting to really wonder, you know, what's next? Some people really felt that the world was out of control in 1968. Uh, they felt like they couldn't trust their government, uh, and that Americans needed so much help, and there was so much work to be done. We know that 40,000 students demonstrate all over the country this year. Um, as they are trying to pick a new candidate since uh, Bobby Kennedy, uh, JFK's brother, was the front runner, till he, front runner candidate until he was assassinated. They end up choosing a new candidate, Hubert Humphrey, who really doesn't have quite the same pizzazz. Uh, and then there ends up being riots uh, outside of the Democratic National Convention in Chicago over uh, racism, over police brutality, over this candidate himself, over so many different issues. The Democrats were talking about potentially getting out of Vietnam, but talking about how it was going to take time. President Nixon, or I should say um, he was the vice president under Eisenhower's administration, but Nixon was claiming that uh, as soon as he got into office, he would have a rather quick withdrawal, a safe end to the war with low casualties, and of course we would win. And so Americans liked hearing that. You know, Nixon seemed stable. He was a well-known name since he had been vice president under Eisenhower. Remember, he had ran against JFK in 1960 for the presidency and he had lost. So Nixon instead will become the next president. Will the convention be in order? In late August, the city of Chicago was the host city for the Democratic National Convention. Will the convention be, will the sergeant at arms enforce order in the convention? Delegates from all 50 states arrived to find Chicago an armed camp. The city's mayor, Richard Daly, knew that tens of thousands of young demonstrators were also on their way. They're here as guests of the Democratic Party and let them conduct themselves accordingly. They were determined to have their say. All across the country, the, the new left was trying to provoke people into actions that would escalate the whole thing. You never saw people so provoked in all your life as those Chicago police. The things those kids said to them. I take one look at these things out here and I know what America's about. The gestures they made to them, deliberately designed to bring on this reaction. So yes, yeah, so you can see that there was chaos, the Democratic National Convention, as people were upset about the Civil Rights Movement, about Bobby Kennedy's death, about Martin Luther King Jr.'s death, about anti-war protests, where the country was headed, purposely provoking police officers, and then police officers responding with police brutality. Things, things were out of control in 1968, which is why, like I said, and we talked about this yesterday, people are going to support Richard Nixon as the new presidential candidate because... He promises to restore law and order. He's all about the new right. He's all about conservatism. Um, you know, he's a well-known name. He'd been vice president under Eisenhower. He promised to end the Vietnam War safely, quickly, with low casualties, uh, and of course, win the war. And so he was, you know, plays into really kind of, um, you know, the anti-communist fears that people still have. He seemed just a better speaker all the way around and had a better plan than Hubert Humphrey. And so naturally he wins. 
you know, as people who were angry with the counterculture and the changes happening in America, um, Nixon kind of supported everything that was the opposite of that. So thinking so far about what we've talked about, what happened in the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, just realize that it was, you know, a chaotic year where people were protesting and there was violence and 1968 really kind of highlighted the out of controlness in America. So thinking to what you saw yesterday in your president's video clip about uh, Nixon, remember they talked about how Nixon was power hungry. He was crazy. He was obsessed with kind of running the government himself. He kind of sidestepped the secretary of state in charge of foreign affairs and the secretary of defense. And he kind of had the whole Vietnam War uh, played out between him and this man, Henry Kissinger here, who is his advisor. I want you to make sure that you write down Vietnamization. So Nixon's policy, his plan to end the Vietnam War, is he wants to slowly withdraw the half a million American troops. There's almost half a million there there now um, that are stationed in Vietnam fighting. And he wants to replace those troops with you know, more Arvin with more, you know, South Vietnamese troops. So that's his plan is to take the young kids, the older men in Vietnam, train them, give them better weapons, uh, and replace them kind of with American troops. At least that's what he's telling the public. And he makes it sound like he's slowly going to be pulling out of the war. But as if you think back to what we saw yesterday in the president's video clip, Crazy Nixon is power hungry. You know, he thinks he's the greatest president of all time. He's recording all of his conversations, everyone else's. He has lists of people that he thinks are the enemy, who betrayed him, that he's betrayed. And he's pretty much going to be lying to the American people. Um, you know, he does pull out 25,000 um, men with at, within the first year. But remember, he secretly starts bombing Laos and Cambodia. And he figures if he secretly bombs Laos and Cambodia, he will bomb them into submission and he will stop supplies from going, you know, through the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Remember, President Johnson fought that limited war. He never wanted to attack Laos or Cambodia directly. He figured that if he did that, um, you know, it would bring more countries into the war. It could perhaps, you know, anger China and Russia, making it World War III. It would destabilize those countries' economies. And guess what? It did stabilize, destabilize those countries' economies. As they start to bomb places like Laos and Cambodia, it's going to make it possible for um, the Khmer Rouge, uh, which is this crazy communist government, to come to power and kind of massacre uh, millions of people and kind of ruin their lives. So, yeah, this was not a good choice. And he hides this from the American people, claiming that they're going to slowly withdraw. They're going to have peace with honor. They're going to stop the spread of communism. It's going to be a victory. It will save American lives. But in reality, he's lying. I'm just like the lot most of the guys I would see in Vietnam. I'm just gonna do my time and get out of here if I can. I'm not here to win a war. I'm just here to do my time and rotate. How short am I? How much time do I have left? That's the biggest concern of everyone. And can I make it? The war was not gonna be won. It was just gonna be exited in the best possible political manner. And it was about dog-eat-dog -dog and survival. Really a very brutal prison-like existence of, uh, of survival. Inside, that really eats away at you. That has a, has a tremendous negative effect on your spirit and your, your sense of worth and your sense of purpose. You know, I was tired of all of it, weary of it. Too many deaths and too much pain and too much suffering. By 1970, American troops left in Vietnam felt the country was abandoning the war and them. The number of American ground forces had been cut in half as part of President Nixon's pledge to win peace with honor. As the pullout continued, 
new recruits, overwhelmingly draftees, felt they were being asked to fight a war already lost on the battlefield and despised at home. The enemy had no doubt about its purpose. Its only way out of the war was victory or death. Unlike American soldiers who came to Vietnam and they came only for one year and then got out, in Vietnam there was no draft period like a one or two years. So you would go on to the end of the day, to the end of the war. And I guess what he said there basically sums up, you know, the differences of opinion here about Vietnam. The Vietnamese, as I've been saying, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, they're fighting for their country, for what they see as freedom, as Americans, as invaders, as busybodies. Whereas Americans don't entirely understand what they're fighting for, supposedly to stop the spread of communism. But as the guy kind of said, they're depressed, they feel alone, they feel isolated, um, they're overwhelmed, they feel forgotten, and they're just waiting to get out of there, but they've really lost their desire to fight, and they don't really feel like the country's, you know, with them. And remember, at this point, Americans have had troops on the ground with advisors dying since 1961, and at that point it's 1970, so Americans really have lost their resolve. So the My Lai Massacre we kind of already mentioned earlier, make sure that you write that down, that it's the mass murder of unarmed South Vietnamese civilians by U.S. troops. Um, you know, we saw that earlier in one of the video clips here, but, you know, the U.S. troops basically come across a town and they think it's going to be held by the Viet Cong. Um, they're unclear at first, we think, about whether it's, you know, Viet Cong troops there or South Vietnamese. Remember, we talked about how there's definitely... Um, you know, confusion between who's friend, who's foe. But we also think that some of these troops are perhaps power hungry, are exerting their power over others, um, you know, making, you know, very immoral choices and you know, using very violent means. We know that in this massacre, though, that many, many civilians uh, and some, you know, some children and some elderly, um, you know, just regular people are going to get, you know, assassinated by U.S. troops, which is why this information is actually kind of covered up for a year. It eventually does leak out, and it's why when some of these troops come home, they're not welcomed. They're called baby killers. Um, you know, people say, why are you fighting? Well, if you're drafted, you don't have much choice. Um, but, you know, these people are not going to be getting these soldiers a warm welcome home, which leads to a lot of these mental health issues and use of drugs, alcohol, you know, things of that nature. Uh, a lot of these, you know, Vietnam vets are not going to get the respect that they deserve. And unfortunately, as they struggle in their own personal lives, you know, we see some of them, um, you know, ending up being homeless and things of that nature. So Nixon, yet again, continues to cover up that he's doing all these bombings. Uh, he's actually sending ground troops and invades Cambodia. So uh, what you also want to put down in your notes is not just the My Lai Massacre, that the U.S. murders um, unarmed civilians uh, in South Vietnam, but also put down that Nixon invades Cambodia. So, you know, Johnson's fighting this limited war. Nixon claims he's going to end the war, but he's lying. He actually is bombing Cambodia and Laos and invades Cambodia, um, thinking that he can cut off the supply lines and trying to destroy the Viet Cong supply centers. You know, and yet again, he's trying to hide all of this from the public but as people eventually are going to find this out, they are going to be protesting more so than ever before. Very, very angry. I think we're gonna skip that one, it's kind of rough. More and more students as they're protesting, we're gonna see violent Vietnam protests um, at Kent State University. Protesters are gonna be burning the ROTC building. Four protesters are gonna be shot. Eight are gonna be wounded. You really don't have to write that one down. That one's not on the test. Eventually, though, um, what we're going to see happen, though, is that if you think back to the president notes yesterday, uh, remember, we're going to see that, you know, uh, eventually the public will kind of find out. We'll see some of the journalists printing that uh, Nixon was indeed, um, you know, bombing Cambodia and Laos and sending in ground troops. Remember, Nixon orders wiretaps into these journalists' buildings, which so this is the beginning of this huge scandal we think of Watergate, where the president is power hungry thinking he can control things and wiretap and listen in on people's conversations. Um, President Nixon, though, will try to make good on his campaign promise because, you know, he's thinking about, um, you know, re-election. And he is going to, in fact, get um, re-elected to a second term. Part of the reason he does get re-elected 
is because he has a group that kind of is illegally wiretapping at the Watergate Hotel and listening in to kind of, um, you know, what's happening kind of in the enemy camp of the Democratic Party, trying to figure out their campaign plans and such, just trying to always gather information, we think, on the enemy. He was wiretaping all sorts of people uh, and, you know, recording what they're doing illegally. That goes against your Fourth Amendment rights. People cannot be listening to you um, and searching your property and doing anything of that nature. But he was over, you know, using his power as president for his own personal gain to ensure he could get reelected. Once reelected, um, you know, he claims that uh, they're going to end the war peacefully. And so at the Paris Peace Conference in January 27th of 1973, the U.S., the North Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese, the Viet Cong signed a peace treaty. And they say the war is going to be peaceful and they're going to basically, um, you know, divide up the area, so to speak, kind of going back to where they all originally began. And Americans will start to um, withdraw even more so from Vietnam. However, uh, there's still Americans who are, you know, living at the American embassy and there are still American troops, um, you know, in Vietnam, even after 1973. And by 1975, um, in that March, fighting will resume between North and South Vietnam. North Vietnam will attack and capture Saigon, that capital of South Vietnam, uh, and Americans are going to see our fleeing there into that helicopter. Any Americans who are left, uh, you know, still living in the community, at the embassy, troops, they're all going to be fleeing at this point and leaving uh, as, you know, after all these 20 years of fighting, North Vietnam will still eventually capture South Vietnam. In April of 1975, two years after American combat troops had left Vietnam, North Vietnamese forces reached the outskirts of Saigon, the South Vietnamese capital. An ally the United States had supported with men and material for nearly two decades was about to fall to the communists. It was almost like we were never there now. And uh, that's the tragedy of it, I think. On April the 29th, there were still more than a thousand American personnel in the city. They and 6,000 desperate South Vietnamese were helicoptered out as the last remnants of American power fled Saigon. Veteran Phil Caputo had returned to Vietnam as a reporter. The North Vietnamese were shelling Tansanu Air Base. Oh, I remember uh, some of those shells landing close to my building was just trembling. And somebody said, go, go, go. And I remember running out and just leaping in this big CH-53 helicopter, huge thing. Come on, this way, hey, this way, come on. Come on, come on let's go, yeah. Must have been 60, 70, maybe 80 Vietnamese refugees and a few American newsmen, a handful of people uh, from the embassy. So you can see people are just literally fleeing and running. And so, like the man said, it's kind of sad because after 20 years of fighting, uh, it was like Americans weren't over there. The North Vietnamese still win against the South Vietnamese. Now, during this time period, President Nixon uh, is going to get investigated. Um, finally, information will leak out that he was committing all this wiretyping and fraud and taping journalists, you know, who had exposed him, um, you know, in his Pentagon papers and, you know, had exposed that he had been secretly bombing things and he was angry at them. So he was recording their information, their personal phone calls, people realizing that he was uh, breaking, had a team breaking into the Watergate Hotel to find out information about his political opponents. And so he'll get investigated by Congress for 14 months. Eventually he was going to get impeached and probably found guilty and removed from office, perhaps face jail time uh, for obstruction of justice, because as I said, he can't do that. It violates the Fourth Amendment. So. He decides to resign. Uh, Vice President Ford becomes president, and he actually pardons the president, which makes a lot of people angry that the president does not face any jail time and leads many people to feel more disillusioned with the American government, uh, with what happened in Vietnam, uh, with the ill treatment of soldiers, with you know the lack of changes in the civil rights movement, uh, and with kind of President Nixon and kind of how the government is treating and responding to things as well. Eventually, when we're looking at the Vietnam War, you don't really need to write down any of this. Um, you know, same thing on the last slide. You don't need to worry about writing it down too much. But we've got 
many Americans, 58,000 killed, 303,000 wounded, 3.3 with million with PTSD. Um, and so overall, you've got the Vietnam War Memorial there in Washington, D.C. to kind of commemorate all those forces who, you know, paid the ultimate price, lost their lives uh, in this war that was highly controversial in American history and is still considered really a loss. All right, guys, that wraps us up. For the rest of the time today, you guys can work on your test review sheet or you can play Kahoot. Uh, take the test tomorrow while you're home on Class Marker. If you've got trouble logging in, let me know, or you can take it tonight. It's already open. Uh, email me with questions. I hope to see you guys on Thursday. That's it for today, guys. Later. I hope to see you later.